Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I am a board-certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love sharing the nutrition stories of both professional and recreational athletes, and I also enjoy teaming up with my sports dietitian colleagues to discuss a variety of important nutrition topics. Today, sports dietitian Holly Samuel joins me to talk about body image among athletes. We landed on this topic because so many of our own clients and athletes we interact with hyper-focus on weight or other aspects of their physical appearance. Sometimes this focus comes from a performance lens and other times it's aesthetic. Often, honestly, it's both. And this is a challenge because many of these people aren't fueling enough to begin with to maintain good health and hit performance goals. Their desire to look a certain way or reach a specific and, let's be honest, often arbitrary weight usually makes everything worse. So how can you as an athlete who is experiencing negative body image improve or at least neutralize your mindset so that you can embrace fueling yourself adequately and withstand the physical demands of training and of life? And what do we as sports dietitians do when we've worked with an athlete to help them eat, feel, and perform better and achieve improved health, but they still struggle with poor body image? Holly and I explore all of this in today's episode. Prioritizing health over physical appearance is important in the long run, especially if you hope to have longevity in your sport and other day-to-day life activities. But I really want listeners to know that struggling with body image is extremely common and normal. I certainly have experienced and at times continue to experience body image struggles. I think it's safe to say that most human beings do. Our bodies are meant to change throughout life and this change can be really hard. Improving mindsets surrounding body image is an ongoing process and there are no quick fixes, but I do hope that this episode helps. One last thing, Holly and I are dietitians, we're not therapists, and while this is something that we frequently work on with our clients, meaning around mindset, um, we of course respect our scope of expertise. So if anyone is really struggling, please consider seeking mental health support. I am a big fan of therapy, both for myself and for my clients when it's warranted. All right, please enjoy my discussion with Holly Samuel on body image for athletes. Holly, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. So happy to have you on here. How's everything going today? Thanks so much for having me. It's great to hang out with another sports dietitian. Um, things are going great. Yeah, we're we're in summer. It's my favorite time of year. So um, yeah, I'm just trying to get outside as much as possible before I'm reminded that I live in New England and it's cold again. <laughs> what part of New England are you in? Uh, we're in New Hampshire. Oh, nice. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, yeah. So before we dive into today's topic, I'd love for you just to share a little background on yourself, um, both as an athlete and a sports dietitian. Sure. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, where do I start? <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, right? Big question. I was going to say, big question. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I became a dietitian. I, you know, kind of did that right out of college and my like first kind of clientele population that I'm bringing this up because I think it'll be relevant to our conversation today. Um, but the first kind of person that I worked with, I worked in a lot of like diabetes education, bariatric surgery, weight loss management, a um, little bit of like cardiac prevention, you know, kind of general health, general population um, before, you know, kind of getting my master's focusing in health education and eating disorders and then niching down, starting my private practice and working primarily with runners and athletes and getting that sports dietitian uh, board certification. So I've worked with a lot of different types of people um, and it's really helped me a ton in my, in my practice, but yeah, primarily now working with runners. Um, I am a runner myself. I was not always a runner. I first um, competed um, like horses. I was a horseback rider. I was a horse girl. Um, Yeah. I rode horses uh, very competitively through I mean, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, a little bit post-college too. Um, That was kind of like my primary sport. And like, if I were to go back and tell myself, actually, you don't ride anymore, you run, I would be like, are you kidding? What? (laughs) Um, Because it was my main sport and I hated running, um, but I fell in love with it somewhere along the way in college. um, And yeah, it escalated quickly. I've run a bunch of marathons and now I work with runners. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of been a journey, but I, I'm super grateful for it. 
Awesome. I, okay, this is a really stupid question, but for if you're writing, like, what kind of training do you have to do for that? Do you are you doing running? Are you doing other? I mean, I'm, I'm sure. That, I mean, I know it's a sport. I know there's all kinds of training, but I actually yeah. know nothing about because I've I've ridden a little bit, but it was more like Western style when I was little, or yeah, yeah. I didn't do much of competitive stuff. Yeah, so I rode, um, I did hunter jumpers and equitation, so like English side of riding, and that's basically mm-hmm. for people who are like, what are you talking about? Um, that was kind of the type <laughs> of riding where like the competitive competition part and the part that's yeah. like in the Olympics um, yeah. is you enter a ring full of jumps and you have to jump them in a certain pattern, either to be the fastest and not knock anything down. Um, or the other side of that is to be like the prettiest and make it look effortless. So Got just it. like ballet or dancing or cheerleading where it's like, it looks so effortless. It's like, you know, it's not effortless if it looks yes. effortless. So, um, yeah, the type of training that I did was mostly just, you know, contact with horses. So I was riding, a ton. Um, you know, every single day I actually got out of gym in high school because of how much I was riding and competing, which is ironic. Cause I, again, hated running, hated gym, didn't want to do it. <laughs> now it's like, I'll pay, you know, $300 to go run Boston, but, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> wild, but, um, it was a lot of just time in the saddle. Um, you know, and, and in terms of like, what kind of workout it is. This is why I love working with runners who used to be or are currently still riders because I totally Mm -hmm. understand. It's so hard to describe because you can't really replicate what you're doing in a gym. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit of cardio. It's a lot of strength, um, a ton of like core control. Um, Mm -hmm. I have never been stronger in my core than when I was riding like eight horses a day because you have to be, um, because they just have a mind of their own and they don't like to be controlled sometimes. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's super cool sport. I really miss it. I, I burnt out from it. Um, the, the horse world is very political and it's tough to be in and it's not one of the sports where, oh, like running, which is why I fell in love with running eventually where it's like, oh, you kind of get in what you or get out what you put in. Like, it's just not Mm -hmm. always like that. Sometimes it's about Mm -hmm. finances and politics. And um, there's actually a lot of eating disorder presence in the riding world too. I I was going to ask about that. (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure. That overlaps quite a bit. I was very lucky. I was brought up in an environment that did not have any tolerance for that. And it was super supportive and very neutral, which is Mm -hmm. so rare. Um, So I didn't really struggle with body image until like later um, when I started (laughs) to like enter college and stuff. But um, Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting sport. Wow. That's so cool. I mean, it kind of reminds me of thinking back to, I, I, I was talking with someone about formula one, someone linked to that. And, and you're, it's like, again, one of those things where it's like, obviously, you know, it's a tremendous amount of training and work and like right. neck strength and all that stuff. But it's, it's not in the same way that you think of training with like running or other sports like that. But um, that's yeah. really interesting. And, and I know you're also a personal trainer. So where did mm-hmm. that kind of enter the picture? Yeah, I, I've always loved, like, I know I kind of joke about hating running and like, I really did. I didn't like it, but I always loved just like being active and, you know, I liked, I liked being strong, like, and feeling that way. And the other thing I didn't mention is when you're, when you are an equestrian, like it is a lot about the sport, but it's also about like the horsemanship and stuff on the ground. And I worked Mm. through, um, you know, I, I worked to kind of help pay for things in the barn. So it was just a lot of manual labor also, um, working (laughs) on farms for, you know, two, two decades. But, um, you know, it's, I always loved just being able to like throw a hay bale six feet above my head or like, you know, be really strong. So, um, you know, when it kind of came to doing stuff in the gym, I was always kind of like, I should be able to do stuff in the gym. Cause like, I have to tame this thousand, you know, this like really heavy beast, like outside of the gym. But, um, I had it in my head when I started to become a dietitian that obviously nutrition, fitness, they're kind of interrelated. Surely, surely I will learn about exercise in my dietetics journey. And like, you really don't. And actually you're kind of told it's out of your scope of practice. And I learned that a lot of dietitians, like, don't overlap at all in fitness or understand it. So um, I actually had like a tough time deciding what I wanted to major in in college because of that, because we also had kinesiology and exercise phys Mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But um, I kind of like, you know, saw through, well, I want to work in healthcare. So let me go 
get my license in dietetics, but also let me maybe add on like personal training certification to that. Um, and I like had this weird, I think I've talked about this before on podcasts. I don't know, but I've had, I had this like weird thing in my head that I was like, I can't possibly be a personal trainer without having run a marathon. I don't know why, because Hmm. they do not go together at all. But I was like, I need to be like, you know, the pinnacle of fitness to be a personal trainer, which is not true. You just have to learn how to train other people. Um, and like, sure, practicing what you preach is helpful, but so I didn't go and get that until I ran my first marathon because I had this weird like timeline in my head, but I'm really glad I did because you just don't learn a lot about, you know, fitness and training in, in dietetic school. Sure. It's also funny you say you have to be at the pinnacle of fitness and you equate yeah. running a marathon to that because like think right. about how many people have run marathons who are most definitely not at the pinnacle of fitness. No, it's like um, its own yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, it's completely separate. But okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for, for talking us through all of your background and all of that. I've, I've, I love hearing about people's journeys generally, whether it's food related or fitness or whatever it is. So it's always interesting yeah. to hear where people come from. Um so let's get on Shay's topic now. So we're going to be talking about body image, especially in the context of athletes, since hmm. we are both, you know, working with active people. Um, and it's such a tricky one because, you know, for the most part, we're trying to get our athletes to eat more. Uh, I know we've both talked about on our own podcasts and, and on Instagram and elsewhere that, you know, we're usually, <laughs> it's so common, especially for endurance athletes to not be eating enough. And there's just this huge mental hurdle there. Um and often it's not intentional, but regardless, just getting people to really truly understand what their energy ma- needs are and to actually follow through is is really hard. And it could be a, a mental thing, could be logistics. All, there's just so many obstacles. So um, I thought we could kick things off by chatting about where this kind of body dissatisfaction and or hyper focus on weight and body composition, where that's all coming from, because we know that sometimes there's this, oh, you know, coming through the perf- the performance lens, right? There's that whole thing. Then there's just not feeling comfortable in your own skin. There's, you know, what we observe, absorb, not, well, observe and absorb from the greater, <laughs> from society and the greater world, whatever. Um, so yeah, maybe at least you can talk through what your experience has been with this. Yeah, it's, um, it comes up all the time. And I mean, like you said, the, under fueling problem that I know you've probably talked about, like until you're blue in the face on all of mm-hmm. your platforms, like I have, yep. um, it can be intentional or unintentional. I tend to find like nine times out of 10. And obviously I attract a certain person to work with me, but, um, you know, I tend to find nine times out of 10 with my clients, the person who is like, I don't really have, you know, body image problems. That's not the main reason why I want to work with you. I just want to understand how I should be fueling. Nine times out of 10, once we start fueling adequately, or I tell them how much they need to be fueling and they're starting to wrap their heads around that, they're like, but what's that going to do to my weight? Yes. (laughs) Um, You know, so relate to that. (laughs) It comes, it comes up like it just, it comes up naturally for a lot of people, even if they kind of thought, yeah, I've always been fine, you know, in my own skin, unless something changes. Um, Mm -hmm. so I think a lot of the times the fear can be one of the biggest barriers to actually doing what you're supposed to be doing from a feeling perspective. Um, and I know some people too, who, you know, are actively working through that discomfort and they're doing the thing anyway, and they're fueling adequately and their body does change, which also happens very often. Um, you know, it's, it's something that can really, almost trigger them to not keep going, um, and following through. So I love that we're talking about this because it is, it's such a big barrier for people. Um, and I always kind of say, I can tell you the most perfect nutrition plan that's evidence-based, that's custom tailored to you. Um, you know, but if you can't implement it because you're too afraid or there's that mental barrier, then it doesn't matter. (laughs) Um, yeah, so exactly you know, kind of navigating that is super important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, offline, we were both saying how, you know, we, we both on our platforms kind of touch on this all the time, whether it's a little bit here and there in a podcast episode or whatever, but I really felt it was important to just focus on the thing finally, because, because we encounter it so much and, you know, and it's a really hard one, you know, there's no easy fix. There's no magic pill or, you know, 
like quick answer here. It really is like a process and it's a lot of work. And quite frankly, it's something that, you know, I want, I want my listeners to know, like, it's something I've certainly struggled with. I continue to struggle with here and there. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not something I, I struggle with as much as I used to, but we're all human beings and we're all in bodies. And I think we all have days where we're like, Oh, this doesn't feel good. Or I don't like the way this looks. So I want to, I really want to be upfront with the fact that we're validating your feelings. If you are not feeling comfortable in your skin, like I get it. I really do. And we're not dismissing that at all. Um, it's more just that we want to explore how can we like not move past it, but move with it, I guess you could say. And maybe on certain days you are not thinking about it, but how can you learn to really support your body to withstand the physical demands of everyday life and all of the training you're asking your body to do? Like, that's really the thing we're exploring here. Um, and I don't know if you want to kind of chime in with anything about your own experiences, but like, I just think it's so important to know that, like, we're not sitting on a pedestal here being like, oh, you shouldn't care about your physical appearance. You know, like, I think it's fine to care about your physical appearance. I, I think it's great. Like, I, you know, yes, we want to be healthy. And if you want to look good, too, fantastic. <laughs> you know, but, but there's a cost at a certain point when you're prioritizing that too much over other things. Yeah, I think what we're getting at, too, is like, there's so many determinants of health. Um, yes. and, ha and happiness. And, you know, it's not, it's not so simple. Um, I think what's sold all the time in all the media, um, is, you know, if you look this way, you will feel this way. Um, and trust me, that is not always true. I've worked with, <sighs> you know, so many people who have lost hundreds of pounds, a hundred pounds, several times, They've had surgery. They've gone through the ringer of trying different diets, which is really just hard on you physically and mentally. Um, and they have ended up in the body that they thought would make them happy, and they are not. <laughs> um, and that's super heartbreaking and frustrating because, you know, imagine going through, you know, what you thought would kind of be a journey to lead you to ultimate happiness and not finding that and feeling like you're just constantly chasing your tail. It's exhausting. So um, I always kind of like to point out to people that one, there's a lot of determinants of health. It's not just about appearance and weight, um, you know, and as a healthcare provider and a coach, it's really important, you know, for me to be kind of helping you measure those other things too, so that, you know, we're making sure that we're staying honest to making sure you're just staying healthy. Um, and also, you know, your mindset is often like a totally different thing that we also have to make sure we're working on. They don't always go together. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, I'll, I'll fuel adequately to, you know, support all the training I'm trying to do. And that will lead me to, you know, either be so happy I don't care about how I look or it'll lead me to look a certain way and then I'll be happy. And it's like, we kind of need to like almost divorce those things because that is not always how that goes. It can go that way for some people, but I often see it doesn't always go that way for a lot of people. So um, it's still important to implement, you know, these nutrition behaviors, these lifestyle behaviors to support health, um, you know, in general and your goals. But, you know, sometimes it's not the it, like there's more we also need to be doing from a mindset perspective. Yeah, for sure. And I think it also doesn't help when you're really like invested in a certain performance goal. Sure. So like, you know, let's say, and I, I used to be there back when I was like road racing more and cared about times and PRs and all that stuff. And it's totally mm -hmm. fine to be doing that. But when you're just so invested in that and your identity is so tied into you as a runner and you as a, you're trying to get whatever, you know, and you, you don't hit that or you're, really just like trying to do everything you can to hit that. I, I think that can really, these things are all connected is what I'm trying to say. And, and that kind of thinking can really bleed into how you're feeling yourself and how much you're paying attention to your body and what it looks like, and what you think it should look like in order to hit that goal. And, you know, there, again, there's a lot in this narrative um, and there's a lot going on. And as you said, there are a lot of, um, you know, determinants for health and performance as, as, 
I know I've talked about many times on here. Um, yeah. And, and I will say, I mean, do you find that in terms of like struggles with body image, I think a lot of athletes generally struggle. Um, do you find that other kind of groups of people tend to struggle more? Um, like in terms of age or other things, I'm trying to think about my experience and I don't, I don't know if it's fair to say that it's a lot of middle-aged women struggle the most, but um, I know postpartum moms struggle a lot, but I don't know if you found that certain populations like struggle more than others in your experience. Yeah. I, again, I've worked with so many different people in different types of settings. So like I have yeah. worked with the folks who qualify for like bariatric surgery Mm, um same mm -hmm. and you know that is definitely and again like it i i'm attracting a certain person right so of course yes, i'm going to yes, see the yes. struggles up front of so course. it's not maybe like super reflective of like the world but um sure you know people in larger bodies tend to struggle more i think with body image because we yeah. do prioritize thin thinness um and shrinking ourselves in our society i do think more women and you know um you know, people identifying as women struggle a little bit yes. more because of like double standards. And again, the kind of like thin ideal that's impossible to achieve. <laughs> um, but yeah. I also do think men struggle and I think a lot more of them do than what they're willing to share. And I wish they would keep yes. sharing because when they do, you know, it validates um, that that's okay. And just being able to share that and then do something to help yourself. Um, I tend to work with more women, but I think, um, I think that's true. And I think for our kind of like sports population runners, I, I don't know, like, I don't know if someone struggles more than the other, but I tend to see a lot of different people. I see the people who maybe feel like they're like a larger bodied runner and they don't fit in mm -hmm. with what a runner mm -hmm. is quote unquote supposed to look like. Um, I think we're doing a good job starting to change that image, but it's definitely, you know, we still have progress to make there. Um, an exercise I do with my clients is I'll kind of like click through past covers of runner's world. And it's like, who do you see on the cover? You see the same person on the cover. It's the same like thin, white, young female who's joyfully running mm -hmm. through a field. You know, we're starting to see more diversity with that, but it's really been programmed into our heads. That's what a runner's supposed to look like. Um, so I think people who are like, I don't look like that at all. And I'm never going to look like that. Um, I think they really struggle with body image, um, just because they're kind of set up to, um, I also think the person who maybe like, is kind of like, I could be that person on the cover. Like if I am perfect enough, I can almost achieve that. And it's exhausting to try and maintain that. And I think that person may also struggle if they start to like deviate from that at all, because our bodies are supposed to change over the course of life, which brings me to your point the middle-aged population. Um, you know, I think the, any, I mean, I, I don't want to throw guys out the window, but like women tend to go through more like physiological changes, like to have the potential yeah. to at least during life, whereas men have like this slow and steady change, um, you know, in a vacuum, not always outliers, yeah. but <laughs> over the course of yeah. life. And I think anytime your body's like about to go through a transformation, you're going to be potentially triggered to have body image issues, um, especially when it is maybe deviating further and further away from what that like thin, perfect ideal is. So like pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, I think those are really big ones um, yeah. because your, your hormones are doing a whole different thing than they used to. Your life's probably doing a whole different thing than it used to. And you're kind of struggling to cling on to a past version of yourself, which we always see through rose colored lenses. Um, so I think putting more like dynamic conversation about that can be helpful. That was a long answer though. <laughs> no, no, that was great. That was great. And, and I couldn't agree more. And it kind of reminds me of like, uh, you know, just thinking of, of, past clients or people who are like, you know, you're in your twenties and you're thinking, oh gosh, I wish I could lose 10 pounds or whatever. And then you're in your thirties or forties. You're like, oh, I wish I looked like when I was 20. Yeah. And then you, you get clients and, you know, they, they say they want to be a certain weight. I'm like, where did that weight come from? And it's like, that's what I weighed on my wedding day. Or that's what I weighed when I ran this PR or, the, or, or, or yeah. actually my male clients too. It's like, it, yeah. you get these like arbitrary numbers and it's, it really is interesting to explore all that. I worked with a lot of people in all different stages of life. Um, and I work, I, I also attract a lot of women, but I work with a lot of, of men as well. And, um, 
but yeah, it's just, it's very interesting to kind of explore all these different struggles and where they come from. Um, yeah, my postpartum moms, you know, whether they're runners or not, because I do work with some people who are just kind of more recreational everyday yeah. athletes or everyday, you know, Same. active people. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle for sure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just thought, I thought that would just, again, I just want to give some context to all of this. And, uh, before we kind of really drill down into kind of some more specifics and strategies and all that, maybe we can go a little deeper into how endurance athletes fit into this picture. So, you know, the whole, the whole belief, the lighter is faster whole thing, like, which thankfully we're, I mean, I think it's still persisting, but we're more and more seeing that, um, you know, publicly that messaging being trashed <laughs> and, um, you know, there are definitely some, you know, prominent athletes and other voices in the space who are really sending positive messaging. Um, I know it was just like what very recently we also saw those uh, with the Colorado coaches not be mm -hmm. out the window. So, you know, and that was, um, I'm blanking on their names. Was it Mark? Was it what more? Mm -hmm. What more? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And Heather, something or other. Um, yeah. So they, that whole thing where they're, you know, they were doing body comp and all this, I mean, all that stuff that was perpetuating this messaging that lighter is faster and we have to be a certain weight and we have to have a certain body fat percentage in order to perform. Not again, not that these things don't influence performance. Yes, mm -hmm. they do, but they're just one thing. So we're starting to see that be backgrounded a little bit more. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just in terms of like endurance athletes, since that's a large part of my audience um, and body image, maybe we can kind of just get a little more specific about this. I'm just wondering if you have anything else to add to what we've already talked about here. Yeah, I think something that I always like to point out, um, to people who are not dietitians, who are not maybe working with people in like one-on-one -on -one or group or more like private settings mm -hmm. is like you and me hear this all the time. We hear this all day long from everyone we talk to. So like, we're very aware <laughs> that it's like a thing where like, this is not like, this is a normal way, like to almost feel it's very like, if not normal, it's common. Um, and I think that kind of helps us probably in our own journeys and just like how we navigate talking to other people about it. But a lot of people don't sit in a room with, you know, someone and like everyone is saying the same thing all day long. So they don't maybe understand how common it is. So they're afraid to talk about it. Um, and I think while you and me both have platforms that we talk from, um, you know, we're not sharing sexy information. Maybe we don't stand out as much as a celebrity or, you know, someone with a much larger platform with, um, you know, all of the kind of like sexy following credentials. And I think it's really awesome to see um, elite athletes, even celebrities, but like, especially just talking to endurance athletes, elite athletes are like celebrities to us. Um, it's really helpful to see them start to have these conversations, um, and start to really just validate and, um, highlight like what the credentialed licensed professionals like ourselves are saying. Um, because, you know, I know, I know what we're saying is not fun all the time. It's not sexy all the time. It can be really scary to some people and it feels like it's super weird and maybe not like the norm, but like when, um, for example, like we're, you know, recording this during the Olympic trials, but like a reporter asked Ellie St. Pierre after she won the 5k and set a record, what her cheat meal was going to be after her setting... cheat meal. Yes. Oh, I and... missed that. And I went to school with Ellie. She was a nutrition major at UNH oh, wow. in my class. And um, she clapped back with, well, I was going to say a burger, but I wouldn't call it a cheat meal. Um, and I think just more like examples of that, of like pushing back and being like, no, I don't want to normalize that talk anymore. Like, yeah. let's mm -hmm. talk about this. I think that's so helpful for the sport um, and yeah. so important because I know we talk about it and see it all day long, but I know a lot of just like regular runners who are you know, out there doing the thing and they're not maybe coaches or dietitians, like they just don't hear it. So I think that kind of stuff is super helpful. And I would love to see more and more people continue to do that. Um, cause I think it just yeah. validates the research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, and also just like how like normalized now 
things like clean eating or this is clean or, you know, it's like that terminology, the good, bad, all that stuff. Like it's just so prevalent. It's everywhere. It's unavoidable. Yeah. And the more we're able to just, again, neutralize that language a bit more, mm -hmm. um, that's going to help. I mean, it's not like the only thing, but it will help to not have to just like be surrounded by that all the yeah. time, all day, every day that, oh, this food is bad or you just... Or even just people commenting on things or whatever, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, again, it's, it's a lot of the stuff is unavoidable. We can't control what everyone else is doing. We can, but we can control kind of how we react, how we respond, the boundaries reset. I think that's one thing. And maybe that's a good thing to get into as, as a kind of segue into maybe some strategies is I think, I mean, there's so many things that we can do, obviously, but I think setting certain boundaries and bringing almost this, I don't know if discipline is the right word, but maybe it is a kind of discipline of how you're handling certain things, whether it's outside information, like someone talking about a cheat meal mm -hmm. and you refusing to call it that, um, or, uh, or, you know, you have, I, I think I saw something on your Instagram, was it yesterday or another, I can't tell what, maybe the algorithm's feeding me old stuff. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> something recently from you about negative, um, about how you're reacting to like mm. negative body image experiences and it being a journey or, or, you know, it's just like, it's all part of the process or something like that. Um, so maybe we can talk about, yeah, talk about boundaries or how we're kind of handling input from because it's one thing to experience things from within right and it's a slightly different I mean I know it's somewhat connected but it's a different thing to have all of these outside inputs whether it's you're reading something in a magazine you're seeing images you're hearing someone say something to you whatever so maybe we can start from external things yeah absolutely I think um some of the strategies I learned like especially in my master's degree when I was we were kind of like understanding how to use like therapy strategies. I'm not a therapist, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. I am trained in yeah. some of that. And like, I think a lot of it's understanding one, like what kind of causes these thoughts to happen? Like what is the trigger or activator, um, that tends to cause this for you. And I think a lot of people like might think that's dumb, but like, if you kind of think about it, it's like, well, actually where, yeah, where does that come from? Like, why do I think that? Um, because sometimes it's very self-inflicted. Sometimes it's something totally that's not you at all. And we, you know, can navigate it that way. Um, and I think if you kind of understand where it's coming from, it's a little bit more, it's not easier, but it's a little bit more straightforward, um, of a process to go about starting to rewire that thought pattern. Um, because body image eating disorders, they are, they're mental health issues. Like they're not necessarily, you know, something that you can see that's super black and white. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not important. So um, I think that's a good place to start too, is like, if you are able to identify, okay, where is this coming from? Um, can we either eliminate that? Or can we, you know, kind of gain some tools to help address that? Um, I think when you're first starting out, sometimes setting those boundaries and like eliminating and getting rid of certain things can be super helpful. But I also understand that navigating life, like you can't control everything that's going to be put in front of you. So having some like life skill tools um, when you're kind of out there in the wild can be helpful too. So some examples like, okay, I kind of get dressed for my run and then I go out the door and do my run. And cause these are things that people have told me before or that I've experienced. And then my, I crushed my speed workout. It was great. And then I come home and then I start to actually feel like I'm second guessing that performance or like I'm not good enough. And I also hate the way my body looks and I'm having trouble getting dressed for the day. Like that can be something that comes up and it's like, well, where did that, like what, what happened? <laughs> cause it was going, whoops, it was going well. Um, yeah. you know, and now it's not going well. So like what happened? And a lot of the times the trigger can be, well, I stepped on the scale and I saw a number that I didn't like, or I was in the bathroom getting ready to take a shower after my workout. And I saw my stomach in the mirror and I was expecting it to look a different way because of how good I felt on my workout, but I didn't like the way it felt or, mm -hmm. um, or like the way it looked, or I, you know, went to go on Strava and then I popped open Instagram and saw, an Instagram model who looks amazing and it made me feel like crap about myself, even though mm -hmm. I just did a speed workout that she probably couldn't do. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think identifying 
which one it was, or maybe a combo of those things is important. Or you did the speed workout. This is a good one. You did the speed workout. You came home, you got dressed and the pants you put on to go to work didn't like quite hit you. Right. So then you're thinking about how your pants don't fit and how you should really lose some weight. And was that speed workout even legit? So you can see how these like cascades happen. Um, and then we can start to like identify and remove some of those things. Maybe we stop doing body checks in the mirror. Maybe we unfollow or limit screen time on Instagram, or we unfollow um, or mute people that are triggering, even if they have the best of intentions, they're great people. Even if it's like your cousin, like we just, we, we don't see them all the time. <laughs> um, you know, it's not about them all the time. Sometimes it's just about our perceptions or we buy clothes that fit our current body. Um, you know, and I think that can start to be helpful. If it's stuff that, you know, we can't really eliminate, but maybe we can start to navigate. That's where a lot of the mindset work comes in handy. Like, okay, I said something terrible about myself. Now I need to say two or three nice things about myself. And it feels super cheesy at first, but if you're not flexing that muscle and practicing that skill, you're not going to get good at it. Um, so you have to practice it, even if it seems cheesy at first, which it does, I think, to a lot of people. Um, but eventually that volume on that voice starts to get louder than the volume on the negative voice. And you actually start to hear it less, which is really helpful. Um, and then also, I think the post you probably are referencing that, that I just made was basically on, you're still going to have those negative thoughts sometimes. And that's normal. That doesn't mean you're a failure or you're like backsliding necessarily, but the act of not acting on them is huge progress. Like I'm noticing that you know, I don't like the way I look today and I'm going to go do my day anyway. I'm not going to restrict. I'm not going to, you know, punish myself mentally, um, you know, because I had a bad moment. I'm just going to kind of sit with it and keep going. And that's progress too. Yeah. And I, again, I think the thing to really emphasize here is I would bet that every single person has those moments, has those thoughts, yep. you know, I mean, I know that some people obviously struggle way more than others yeah. and some people are more positive people than others and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but you know, we're all human beings. We all have negative thoughts. We all struggle with certain aspects of our body, no matter how well we treat ourselves or whatever you want to think about. Um, so I think that, uh, that's just something important to point out. Number one. Um, and number two, yeah, I think those are all really wonderful points that you made. Um, Today's show is brought to you by my business, Eat for Endurance. If you've been a listener for a while, you've surely heard about my self-paced course, Peak Performance for Endurance Athletes, which is a comprehensive guide to everyday and performance nutrition. I am assessing interest in making this a hybrid course, meaning that it would be around eight weeks long and the course would solely be released throughout that time, along with four live hour long Q&A sessions with me. It would be a very small group. I'm thinking like five to 10 people so that I can work closely with everyone and it would be priced at around $650. So that's only $200 more than the course itself just 50 bucks per Q&A session, which is actually very, very low price. Um, but my goal was really to make it affordable because I know not everyone can afford my monthly programs. They are a high ticket item and a lot of people would like to work with me, but it's just not within their budget. So that really was the purpose behind assessing interest for this is to see if maybe some people would like to enter through this more kind of group coaching kind of setting in a way. And I would offer this in late July slash early August. That's when it would start. It would be for all endurance athletes. And if you already bought the course, you could absolutely still join. You would just pay the difference um, and join in the fun. So if this interests you, please let me know ASAP. Claire at eatforendurance.com. I need at least five people to run it. And right now I have three people interested. You could also DM me on Instagram. Um, if I don't have enough interest now, I'll consider doing this another time. But I'm kind of almost at that five person point. So I just wanted to throw it out there on the pod to see if anyone would like to join in. Again, this is pretty low price for this type of thing. Um, especially if it's only five people, you get a lot of access to me for not too much money. So 
Uh, If you're interested in that, definitely let me know ASAP. If you're interested in one-to-one nutrition coaching and and would prefer to do one of my monthly programs, I am accepting clients for early July onwards. And this is really, really when you want to start. If you have a fall race uh, at any point in the fall, even late fall, now is the time that you want to work with me, not later. Now is when we're really working on all the foundational stuff and we're getting fueling in line and just all the good things that we want to be working on. You do not want to leave that to last minute. So definitely summer is where it's at. Get in touch. I would love to work with you and you can fill out a new client inquiry form on my website. You can also schedule a free 10 minute call um, to see if we're a good fit if you're interested. All right, let's get back to the show. I would love to spend a little bit more time on the clothing thing. Yeah. Because I know that logistically it really sucks to have to (laughs) for <laughs> complete and it's very expensive obviously to mm-hmm. rebuy a whole wardrobe i think i think this is a place that a lot of people get stuck where um you know i might get someone who comes to me and when they uh share the reason for working together they're like a they're a bunch of things and they're all the kinds of things we're working on but they also share that they're really unhappy with their weight and i'm always really upfront with people that i cannot guarantee weight loss this is not something we're necessarily actively working on we're really focusing on all these other things blah blah blah. um and you know we're really trying to prioritize health and these other goals and we'll see what happens your body's gonna do what it's gonna do right um and that's really scary for some people and if people can't handle that then we don't you know we don't work together they're we're not a good fit but um but the clothing thing again i validate that because especially when it's someone who works in an office and they have all these expensive clothes, or maybe they just love all their clothes. And Mm -hmm. I always encourage, yes, buy some things that fit you, that feel comfortable, that make you feel better in your body. That always helps, but it's, it's not like it's a grieving process, but I mean, it's, it's really hard. That's really hard. And I don't know if you have anything else you want to say on that. Yeah, I think it's great you brought that up. I And I've said those exact words to people before, like on discovery calls or just like talking yes. to potential clients. I'm like, I can't guarantee I don't have a magic eight ball. I wish I did. Yep. If I did, that'd be I great. I say that. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, trust me, like I've worked in the settings where weight loss is promised and yes. it doesn't always happen, even when it is surgically altered. So um, exactly. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to say that more clearly, but um, yeah, yeah, I think... I think when it comes to clothes, it's tricky. Fashion, clothes, like how we look is an expression of ourselves. Um, You know, everyone I think can kind of remember like when maybe they started to find their own style, even if you're like, I don't really have a style. Well, then that's your style. Like, yeah, same. I'm like, (laughs) athleisure is my style. (laughs) High neck ribbed tank tops are my style. Um, Oh my God. Yes, me too. (laughs) Yeah. So many colors. But um. You know, it's like, that's, you know, you, you kind of find like what you're comfortable in, what makes you feel like you and how you want to present yourself to the world. And I think if that gets changed or you have to buy new items to replace old ones, it does kind of feel like almost this metamorphic like process where you're like shedding a skin and trying to fit in to a new one. Um, And I think there's, there's certain times where that's glamorized and exciting to people um, and maybe something that they can frame more positively. And it's a little bit easier because of what they've been told by society or also just like what they're thinking in their own heads. And for example, if you lose weight and you get to size down, that's always seen Mm -hmm. as a positive, exciting thing for the most part, Um, you know, or, you know, there's like a piece of clothing, like, we all grew up in the generation of like the itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini that the yo play girl got to wear because she ate yogurt all day long and lost weight. Right. So like, you know, maybe it's like, that's like burned into my head. Um, (laughs) maybe it's like the, you know, the, um, glamor of like trying to fit into a certain type of clothing, like a swimsuit or, um, a two piece instead of a one piece. I know is a big one, like for us millennials growing up too. Like, um, it's, it's something where, Like if it's the opposite or different than that, I think it's really tough for people because it feels like they're failing or it feels like they're about to express themselves to the world in a way that they, that's unfamiliar to them or that they don't like. Um, I think pregnancy can be a hard one for people postpartum. You're trying to fit into like literally an old like shell of yourself that is a now a new person um, in the same body, 
but it's a different body. <laughs> um, wearing diapers. Yeah, you're wearing <laughs> diapers and you're trying to feed a new human that was inside you and is no longer. So um, I think that's tough. I think, you know, menopause can be tough too um, because it's, we're taught that like aging or changing is bad unless it is in a specific way um, in society. Yeah. So I think trying to find, trying to first, like you said, kind of grieve that and like identify like what's rubbing you the wrong way and, and working through it can be helpful. Um, and I really like the tool that's helped me before in a variety of different settings that I just described pregnancy, postpartum, just body changes. You're not 17 anymore. Um, I think it's really helpful to try and reframe going to get clothes as like, Oh yeah, I get to go get clothes. Like I get to go get a new way to express myself. Um, and reframing it as a positive thing can be helpful, even if you're like, I hate shopping, I hate this process. Two, the actual act of trying on and getting clothes into your wardrobe, I think is tricky for people because you have to yes. kind of acknowledge the way that you look. So a couple of tips that I've learned through the years um, is things like, you know, when you do go to a store, um, you know, kind of going through the process of bringing clothes to the dressing room, trying them on and not facing the mirror. And first, if they don't feel comfortable, like don't turn around, like don't do that to yourself because you're not going to buy it if it's not comfortable, or at least you shouldn't, because this is kind of the whole point of this process. Um, you know, if you do feel like actually, yeah, this is comfortable, like it's not making me feel uncomfortable in any certain way. It's not rubbing me the wrong way, like literally, um, then I can turn around. And if at first I really don't like what I see, I take it off it's the clothing's problem. It's not my problem. You know, clothes are made to fit me and not the other way around. And I try something different. That can be a good strategy to um, going to stores where maybe you don't know what your size is. Um, because as we know, clothing sizes are dumb. Um, they make no sense. There's no like overlapping and it depends on no. what store and what planet, you know, you're on when it comes to fitting in clothing. So Sometimes just going to a different store or a different brand online and being like, I don't know what size I am. So I have nothing to compare it to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that can be a helpful thing too. If you're like really in your head about the sizes. Um, I've also had people have great success with like buying um, like boxes that get shipped to your house or like ordering online of either like random items like stitch fix or, you know, you're just shopping online because then you can do this in the comfort of your own home without having to go to a totally. store especially if you are in a larger body and they may not have your size in the store, which is also a huge problem. Yeah. And I've also had clients where um, they really were fixated on the size. Again, even though, I mean, sizing is so ridiculous. I yeah. mean, my own size span is like so wide from one brand to the next because it's just so different. But, yep. um, but yeah, I've had them even just cut out a tag. Like they went a size up that size was comfortable and fit them. They cut the tag out so they don't have to look at it every time they put it on. And it was just like out of sight, out of mind. And mm -hmm. they were able to kind of just at least not have it like, cause just having to like, every time they put something on and have it like smack them in the face, now they don't have to think about it. So um, yeah, no, I think those are all really great tips. Um, and I had another one I was going to say, and I just totally forgot it, but that's okay. I'll come back to me. <laughs> Brain fog from being jet lagged. Um, yeah, no, I think that's all awesome. Um, I think, again, with, with clothing, you know, even, oh, I know I was going to say, I mean, sometimes body changes are temporary, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we, and sometimes they're not, but, you know, if it's, you're in a situation where maybe it is a little bit more temporary, or maybe you're also just not quite ready to invest in a whole brand new wardrobe and all the things go get something that really isn't that expensive that, you know, go to Target or whatever, you know, if that's your thing. Um, and again, yeah, I think really emphasizing comfort, you know, you're just not going to feel good if you're not comfortable. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, oh, I know I was going to say. The other thing is there are other aspects of our appearance that we can bring attention to that are, it's not just clothing, you know, accessories are really fun. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy, um, if, you know, you're a woman or you identify as a woman, you know, you can play with makeup, um, yeah, jewelry, whatever, you know, there are just so many, you can play with your hair. Like there are other things that you can do and play with or do for yourself, get your nails done, like whatever, um, that, you know, might make you feel better. And so I've had clients kind of play around with things that aren't related to 
their weight and uh, that part of their body and how clothes fit. And that can also sometimes help. So, um, yeah, there are lots of things to this, obviously, lots of ways to kind of approach this. Um, but again, I, I thought it would be really important or really helpful to kind of move through this in a really specific, tangible way. So thank you for for helping with that. Um, okay, so let's close. Um, is there anything else that you want to kind of go a little deeper on in some of the things you mentioned? Any other kind of mindset kind of tri- t- tips or tricks or anything that, that we haven't already mentioned there? I think um, the the other thing I was going to say about clothes too is like, if you are someone who lives in a seasonal place and it's like been six months since you've worn a certain set of clothes, like don't expect them to feel the same year after year after year after year. They get stretched out, they get shrunk, they get worn, like things change. And like, then you forget about it for six months because you are wearing something else. And then you go to put the shorts or the, the pants or whatever back on. And you're like, does it always feel this way? Is this different? Or like, I just don't like this anymore. Um, you're a new person than you were a year ago, like when it was spring yeah. and you were bringing out the shorts or whatever. So I think sometimes too, just seasonally, sometimes setting up the expectation of, okay, I'm going to take out the clothes that match the weather. And I'm, I might have to go buy like a, one or new two pieces. And that's totally like, that's something we should normalize. <laughs> like, because yes. especially, I don't know, like it depends on what you buy too. Like some clothes, co- clothing companies, you're like, I wore this for two years and it's like really beat up and I can't keep wearing it. Like, you know, I think it's important that, you know, the quality can change, but um, yeah, I wanted to say that too. Cause that's when I, I tend to find comes in cycles with my clients. Like everyone will be doing pretty good. Like August, July, they're kind of like, okay, I found the swimsuit that fits me. I found the, the jeans. I'm like, I'm happy now. And then we get to like October and they're like, my jeans don't fit. My pants feel different. Everything's different. Everything's wrong. And it's not our perceptions of how we feel and how we look can change in a second, even if nothing actually changed about our appearance. So um, I think that's important to point out too. I don't know if you find that, but I started to notice. I was like, this is happening cyclically. Oh, it's during the season changes. Okay. Like this is just. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Or like people's tans fade and then they feel like they look different in the mirror because they're not as tan if they're lighter skinned. Um, And like, I feel that way too. I'm like, I feel like happier. And like, I have seen the sun more when I am tan and that makes me happy. But um, yeah, those things like there are perceptions. They they do matter. They make a difference. So um, just that self-care to make yourself feel good and or recognizing that that can be impactful. Oh, 100%. I'm glad you brought that up. I am like notorious for hanging on to clothes for like a million years. I'm 42. I swear to God, I still have clothes that I wore in high school. And I mean, some of them, no, obviously not all of them fit, like sure. but some of them do just because I mean, my body has definitely changed in a million ways, but certain things do fit. I don't know. It's really bizarre. Yeah. And- and like, but like, I'll have like these old bathing suits. I just got back from a trip to Hawaii and, and I was trying on like a bathing suit bottom and I was like, the elastic has completely stopped <laughs> working. Like this doesn't fit my butt at all. Like it was just falling off. And yeah. I did not lose weight. It's just the clothing is old and I need to throw it away. Yeah. And you know, and so, so like I come across these items in my cl- like of clothing all the time. And as you said, like quality is different. Some pieces like last amazingly and I cannot believe that they've been around for 20 plus years and still look amazing and other things fall apart in two seconds. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's definitely something that I need to practice myself and, and for sure. I, I, yeah, things just, you know, like I'll, sometimes I'll buy a pair of jeans and within the year they just don't fit me anymore. Mm-hmm. And I honestly don't know. I mean, my body probably changed. And again, I'm 42. So things are just constantly changing in my body. And I kind of just at this point where I'm like, you know what, I don't need to hang on to these anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a time there definitely was a time in my life where I think it was also when I used to buy like really expensive jeans. And I'm like, oh my God, I paid like a hundred plus dollars for these jeans. I have to save them because one day I'll fit into them again, or maybe I'll want to wear them again. I'm like, I don't actually, I don't need to keep these. That's a sunk cost. It's gone. I'm never going to recruit that money. I can, yep. I, mean, I guess you can sell things or whatever, but just let it go. Just give it to someone else, you know, let someone else enjoy it. The other thing I'll say too, is it's also just relative, like things are relative to what you're used to. So I know personally, I wear a lot of leggings and sweatpants. These days I've been way more sweatpants oriented and I used to live in leggings and 
now anytime I go to put on leggings, everything feels very tight and restrictive because mm -hmm. they're leggings and that's how <laughs> leggings feel versus how like my Viore sweatpants feel. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, even that I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel good. I feel weird. Like, and I'll have this momentary, like, did I gain weight? No, I'm just wearing leggings <laughs> compared to, you know, so it, it sounds really silly, all this stuff, or even just wearing jeans. I don't mm -hmm. wear button pants anymore, pretty much ever. Mm -hmm. So anytime I put any jeans on, it just feels funny. So Anyways, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think just taking a moment before kind of freaking out about clothes to just like notice how things are feeling. A lot of athletic gear is also very tight, mm -hmm. you know, and it's meant to be tight mm -hmm. um, sometimes. So, yeah, I think I think it's just figuring out what feels best in your body, um, acknowledging that what feels best will change mm -hmm. all the time. Maybe for women, you know, if you're menstruating, like you know, obviously there are certain times that you might be more bloated or, I mean, for anybody really, like, there just may be times that certain things are more, more comfortable than others. And, um, recognizing that, I think that's, that's all very important. Um, one more thing I'll say about, we mentioned the scale and I want to go into that just briefly. Um, I know on another podcast I did with, um, Don Jackson Blander, we talked about, we we're talking about joy. And in, as part of that discussion, we were talking about how people often like obsessively track weight, but they don't track anything else. Mm -hmm. And so what she was saying, and I loved this, was she'll, she was like with her clients, I'll let you track your weight and you can weigh yourself, but only if you track these other measures of progress as obsessively as you are tracking weight. Mm -hmm. So, and in the less, and if you can't do that, then you're not tracking your weight, you know? So, you know, and you were kind of pointing again to, earlier in our discussion about these other, you know, multiple markers of health and stuff. And, and I think it's, you know, whether or not to weigh yourself is something that obviously will depend on the, the person. Um, but I would say for most, and perhaps you agree, I'd say most people would benefit from not weighing themselves. And I'm wondering if you have, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I totally do. I, for me, the, the, and as like a part of my journey, um, the scale was always just like not a good idea for me. Like it was super triggering. It was something that once I got my hands on it, I was like on it all the time, kind of like, okay, you know, this is one, it's scale is so popular because it's easy. You can just step on it. Yeah. It's an easy thing to measure, measuring like your period symptoms, like a little bit harder to measure, a little bit more subjective, but the scale, you step on it, there's a number. So um, I think that's why we like really like to hold on to that um, for one of the reasons in society. But for me, it was always something that was kind of like triggering. It would give me permission to do certain things during the day, or it would kind of like restrict or pun like maybe punish myself, like doing certain things during the day. Um, so when I moved to college. Um, and I no longer just had access to a scale, like all the time. Um, I made the decision to like not buy one from my dorm room. There was like, you know, all those like dorm room checklists. It was like scale. I was like, not doing that. Um, not that was on a dorm room checklist. Yeah. For like, from like 17 wow. magazine or like one of those. Oh, like, okay. Types. Okay. I was like your college. No, <laughs> no, I don't think they did, but, um, like, yeah. you know, and like the, the teen magazine type thing was like, oh, make sure yeah. you bring your scale. And I was like freshman 15, you know, was a big conversation. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, and yeah sure. I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. and it really changed a lot for me. Like just, that was something that, okay, I now no longer have access to this information all the time. Like, and it affected me in a really positive way. And I have not owned a scale, you know, since moving out like of my parents' house. Um, and I cannot imagine having that back in my house and thinking about it in the same way as I used to, because it took up so much mental space and energy for me. So I know for a lot of my clients who feel similarly, like removing that, um, it just frees up a lot more space in your brain to like think about and do other more positive and productive things for your health. Um, and I think for the opposite side of this, what I've also seen be helpful for some people is if they do have access to a scale or they are weighing themselves every day and they can truly think of it as like a data point, like it's not like they almost have desensitized themselves to the scale because of how often they use it on themselves. Um, I do, I do see situations where that can be helpful and it can be, um, successful, but I tend to see it be a bit more triggering for the people that I work with, um, where yeah. 
the weight has a lot more meaning than just being a data point. I think a lot of people are like, I love data. I just want it to be a data point, but it's actually data disordered. Yeah. Like it's not actually yeah. a data point um, <laughs> where we're just like looking at it objectively. It's very subjective and it gets scrutinized. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think, I think it's hard for most people not to have like an emotional response to, to the number. And I think just because we can measure something easily doesn't mean we should. And I think a lot of wearables, a lot of scales are making a lot of things more easy to measure. And I think it can be really problematic for some people. Blood glucose monitors, that's something that's super popular yes. right now in people who don't have diabetes. Um, and I, I think it's, it just, it sets that person up who, again, disordered eating, eating disorders, body image, like, and body dysmorphia, it, they are mental health conditions that you basically have like an on and off switch for genetically. Like, but we don't know, we, we don't know that until it's flipped on. And then we're like, Oh, what's that? Um, you never know when you're going to turn that switch on for someone, um, with all of the data and wearables and stuff that we have access to now. So I tend to sh like for me personally, I shy away from them. I wear my running watch to run and tell time. Like I, I don't have anything else turned on or that I pay attention to, um, I've been reached out to, I'm sure you have too, by like all the companies, like where our product, use our product. And I'm like, that's not a good idea for me. So I'm not going to do it. And I also think a lot of my population, you know, would relate to that too. Um, and maybe it is good yeah. for some sort of population, but I don't think it's mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think what you said is true for most people. It's interesting for me. Um, you know, I have an ED history and, you know, I'm, had, you know, kind of exercise issues a long time ago. And it's funny now it's with the scale. I think I definitely had some, I wouldn't say relapses, but I definitely was more triggered around my pregnancies and postpartum time, How you could know, you because not my, be? my body, I mean, no, <laughs> my body was just so changed. Like I yeah. felt really good. And then that just like really set things off for me. Yeah. Um, you know, my kids are, you know, four and a half and seven and a half now. So I'm removed from it, but, um, but it's interesting. Like, I mean, I even just weighed myself this morning out of curiosity because we just have a scale sitting there out of curiosity of coming back from my trip. And it's, it's, I know it, it's funny because I never thought I would reach this point, but it, for me, it is truly not that I'm never getting this emotional response, but it is kind of this, I don't know. I step on the scale and it's like, Oh, information. Mm -hmm. And it's very neutral for me, which is amazing coming from my history. And, and it's, it's almost like I use it to monitor to make sure I haven't lost weight because mm -hmm. I don't want to lose weight. Um, and just as kind of this information, but it's, it's very random. I don't do it regularly. It's very yeah. sporadic and I don't know. So I, I think everyone kind of has this, their own relationship with the scale, but yes, I agree with you in my, in my experience professionally, most often people kind of need it to be confiscated almost. Mm -hmm. Like I've had people be like, your partner needs to confiscate your scale from you <laughs> and hide it. Um, literally. And that is what helps. Um, and I think there, and, and there have been several instances, I'm not sure if this happened with you, where and this is a great segue into our next topic, and then we'll try to wrap up this discussion, but where <laughs> I've worked with someone and, you know, they're reporting they're feeling better, their energy levels are better, they're sleeping better, they're performing better, like literally everything's better. Um, and, and they shoot themselves <laughs> in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> and then they decide to ignore my advice about not seeing a scale. They step on a scale, uh -huh. freak out, like freak out um, because maybe they've gained weight or not, you know, because again, everyone's body reacts differently. I've had people who say the same weight while they're eating massive amounts more or even lose a little weight. I mean, everything's different. Mm -hmm. So anyways, whatever it was, they step on the scale and then they're just like, I can't do this work anymore mm -hmm. and freak out and leave and they're gone. Um that was a long time ago. I don't have some people do that now. Now I, I, what I more frequently see is we've done this work even early on in the process, or maybe we've gone through for three months and every single thing is better. They're just like life-changing experience. They feel better. Health markers are better. Like everything is better. And then, and they know this, they, they acknowledge it, they love it. And they are struggling so hard mentally with the fact that they haven't lost weight. They're still in their body. Like I had a postpartum mom, mm -hmm. just really, I'm just really struggling. I really want to lose this weight. I'm trying to stick with this stuff. Um, I've had other people just, you know, just, yeah, just feeling really uncomfortable in their skin. Maybe they did gain weight, 
Mm -hmm. through doing these things. But again, they're feeling better. They're performing. All the things are better. So I want to speak to that person. Mm -hmm. What can we say to that person um, to kind of move through this? And and this is, I think, the one that's the hardest, Mm -hmm. you know, because we want to encourage the people who are under feeling to get to this point. But also once you're at, and we kind of, so we managed to get these clients here and now what? So it's that kind of, how do we prevent them from backsliding into old behaviors and really trying to move forward and figure all this out? Yeah. I talk to that person all the time. I think, I think that's why like that needs to be normalized. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'll work with a dietitian and then I will become this like hot fox version of myself. (laughs) And that doesn't always like, that doesn't always perception wise happen for people. It's like a lot of the times, nine times out of 10 for me. Yeah, I do have the person who eats a ton more, is fueling properly, and maintains or loses weight. That's more rare, though. I mean, most people are staying the same, but gaining weight. Um, You know, that's kind of more common for me. And a lot of that, too, is just because, you know, maybe that person's been digging themselves into a hole for a much longer period of time, and their body's going to respond a certain way. It's going to take a lot of time to dig out of the hole. And wherever their body's going to settle when it's happy, safe, and in the same type of environment from a training perspective, like they're not totally switching sports and doing something totally different, like the stimulus is similar. You know, I don't, I don't know what the timeline's going to look like for that person. I can't promise what exactly they will look like, which I know we've talked about earlier. So I can totally see, um, you know, I see all the time the person who is like, I almost like, I should have like a marker on the calendar when people sign up to work with me. It's always around like month two or three, like where this happens. Um, They're like, okay, I'm doing what you say. Oh my God, I feel so much better. Oh my God, my sleep is better. Oh, I'm going to the bathroom every day. Wow, I nailed a speed workout. Oh my God, I just PR'd. Oh, my, my, my vitamins and my micronutrient status and my blood work is better. I feel so much happier. Uh, Screw diet culture. And, um, you know, and then they're like, I weighed myself or I tried to put on the the season changed. That's a big one. Like I said, the season changed and I tried to put on a pair of pants that fit me last year and they didn't. And I'm trying not to let it bother me, but it really does. Um, (laughs) Yes, that is that is that comment right there. I'm trying not to let it bother me, but it does. That's the one I get all the time. All the time. Because I love everything else. I want my I want all the things. Mm -hmm. And to that person, you know, I would say we really need to address head on what our priorities are. Um, yes. Because I, I know a lot of people, myself included, like want to say health is my priority, performance is my priority, and what I look like is not. But also we are visual beings. We have eyesight mm-hmm. as a sense for a reason. And we are exposed to images all day long from media, from other people, just looking at other humans. So like, of course, that also matters. Um you know, I'm not saying it's not okay to have like aesthetic body composition goals. What I'm saying is my role as a healthcare provider is to kind of marry the nutrition and lifestyle behaviors we need to do to make you healthy from all of those other standpoints that we talked about. Um, Sleep, you know, micronutrient status in your blood work, blood pressure, you know, your menstrual cycle, your libido, your hair health, like all of those things, your performance. Um, And also, you know, where body composition falls into place with that. Because I've had people say, I want to look a certain way. And I know when I looked that way, I was not at my healthiest. (laughs) Um, And I think a Mm -hmm. lot of people need to address that. Like, okay, what is the priority? Um, Because if you really, really, really want to look a certain way, um, you know, and we can probably get you to look that way and have a certain status of health with all of these other things. But you know, maybe we're not going to be a runner anymore. Like maybe we need to start really weightlifting a lot and not running, or maybe we need to not be as active and not put as much stress on our body or vice versa. If it's a weightlifter, you know, maybe we need to start doing something different. The stimulus needs to be different, or we need to, you know, even break up with the idea that looking that way is the healthiest version of ourselves um, because it's probably not. So to that person, I think we really need to address what the priority is. And if it is truly 
health and performance and like we also want to look a certain way but that is like a step below because I think it is a lot of the times for people how we feel yes. is more important um at the yes. end of the day and how we look is like down here and we're kind of hoping they'll be like the same at the same time but they're not always mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um you know I think that's where we kind of need to do the mindset work and get these tools and start to, to like I said flex that mental muscle of like positive reinforcement of you know positive self-talk, um, you know, trying to really praise the other laundry list of things we just said are going great and really start to praise those and prioritize those and put those at the forefront and take away the triggers that remind us that the second goal of body composition is not quite where we want it to be. Um, and I think that's really hard and we can't possibly wrap up how to do that in a podcast episode. That is like no. years and years <laughs> of constant work yes. and there's no end destination. There's no finish line. Yep. It's a skill. Totally. It's a skill you have to acquire. Um, yes. And that's, what's really hard. A hundred percent. I echo all of that. And and I know we kind of went through also some tips, like really specific tips and strategies way earlier in the episode. So you kind of, we want to reference those as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I highlight every, I want to underline everything you just said. And I think also just figuring out what your why is with all this, what's important, you know? Um, so as you're saying, like kind of working through your priorities, what is kind of guiding you? What is the most important thing? Um, do you want, you know, if you love running, if you love whatever your sport is, triathlon, whatever it is, is this how, you know, do you want to be doing that for a long time? Mm -hmm. You know, thinking also about what you want. I mean, you are, we're all going to age. We're all going to get older. What do you want your later years to look like? You know, because we have to invest in ourselves now to be able to do those things later. And, um, I think also normalizing certain things, you know, like it's normal to have cellulite in your thighs and, and, you know, it's normal. I mean, I've been watching kind of my face change Mm -hmm. and, you know, like, like just is we're all going to change. And that's what I also like to remind my clients that again, I know these things are hard. No one's saying these things are easy, but we need to expect and normalize change in our appearance. It's just going to happen. And we're just going to do our best to, kind of roll with it and um and all that and and yeah so I think I think all that is 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 very important um I don't know is there anything else that you think we should add to this discussion um other than actually I'll add one last thing you know you mentioned we're not therapists like we are yes we are not therapists there's a lot of there is a lot of overlap in this area in terms of counseling that we do with clients we work on this stuff all the time but obviously at a certain point our expertise ends and you really need to go seek mental health support please do that if um, you feel like you need it but yeah is there anything else you want to say about this topic yeah I think especially if you get to the point, and many of my clients have gotten to this point, and this is how we navigate it, if you've gotten to the point where you've kind of like implemented a lot of the things that I've said, you're like, I wasn't feeling before my runs, and now I am. Oh, I didn't have a long run feeling strategy, and now I do. I wasn't feeling post run, and now I am. My meals look good to like meet what I need to be doing to support my training, I'm doing the things, and we've kind of hit the block of all this stuff is really great health wise, and also I hate the way I look. I think that's a really good crossroads to get to, to say, and now we need to go to therapy. (laughs) Like we need to go into this other container to work on this skill um, and this mindset, you know, transformation that we're looking to experience because we've, we've done the nutrition stuff. You know, you now know what you need to do. I'm not, I'm not, we're not gatekeeping anything. You can go on my feed and put together all my posts. It's all there. Like it's all there. Um, sure. you know, but like it's that constant skill is something that you need to schedule into your life to work on continually. If you want it to get better. Um, just like anything else, if you want to go play the piano, why would you think that like you would just be good at the piano if you don't like practice like pretty consistently, right? Like it's, it's a skill. So I think the right like place to go work on that skill is therapy, especially if you feel like you've kind of absorbed and gained a lot of nutrition knowledge from, you know, Claire, from myself, from other of our colleagues, and your appointments are starting to look like 
okay, I'm doing all the things, but I'm really unhappy with how I look. And we've kind of like hit the limit on how we can help you with our own, you know, kind of like tools that we have for body image. That's where you're going to get so much more out of like what we've taught you. If you also go work on that skill in therapy and it's a strength to go do that, you're going to be, you're going to learn so much about yourself. Um, you know, you're going to become a stronger human, a stronger athlete absolutely can impact your performance, um, and your happiness as an individual. And it's scary to go do that, but it's so helpful. Um, you know, and I really wish more people would like pushing people towards making that jump. Um, you know, you have to do it when you're ready to do it. But I think if you've kind of come to that crossroads and you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, (laughs) um, that is a really helpful tool. So I just want to echo that. Um, I, I see, yeah. I see my clients oftentimes who do that while we're working together, have a lot more success in their performance and in their health and in their just mental health too, with the nutrition stuff. If they've also worked on the mindset stuff with me, but also in therapy, like in that own, you know, dedicated space to do that with a professional who specializes in body image. Um, and Also, I've seen great success from clients where we've kind of gone through the nutrition stuff. We've kind of hit that crossroads. And then I hear from them three years later and they're like, I get it now. Like, I feel like I have the tools now and I am in such a different place than I was. And I'm still doing everything you say. And also my mindset is so much better. And now I'm kind of like having that mindset transformation that I was looking for. Um, But these are scales. There's no finish line. So yeah, I really think that that can be helpful. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of nutrition coaches, people in the media kind of package nutrition again to sell. If you do this, you'll look this way and you'll be happy. Um, and it's just so irresponsible to do that. hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's not how it goes yep, at all. Yeah. I know. I know. And too many people. So just equate like, Oh, if I just lose, if I just lost these five, 10, 15, 20 pounds, I'd feel and look and be so much better. Like weight loss is always the solution for everything. And it's just not, um, again, doesn't mean to say that maybe you do lose weight and you feel better. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not again, invalidating those things, but it's not the answer to everything for sure. Yeah. Um, the other, the last thing I'll share is, um, I know for, you know, I, like I shared, I was in therapy or I'm, I'm still in therapy and, um, I'm certainly working on the way I talk to myself and you just saying it's a skill. It really is. I mean, I've spent my entire life just being very critical of myself and being very hard on myself and kind of trying to learn to be kinder to myself. And, you know, it's often, you know, even my therapist saying like, like, would you say that to someone else? I'm like, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's amazing the things that we say to ourselves Mm -hmm. and would never even dream of saying to someone else, unless you're like an online troll or something, but you know, Mm -hmm. uh, I know you get this, Um, but, but, you know, one thing I've, I've picked up from a friend really is, um, and I've done it for about almost two months now is this little like gratitude journal. And you were talking about, Oh, it seems cheesy. And it like, it really felt so cheesy to me to like have this little journal I do every night. But as someone who really, my automatic way of thinking is to jump to what are the bad things that happened today or the things I didn't do or what I did wrong or, or you're just all, what are the negatives, right? That's just my way of thinking. Not to say I'm not a positive person ever, but that's just like the way I think. Mm-hmm. And so instead at the end of the day to think about moments of joy and um, things I'm grateful for and just jotting down real fast. And it's like a really, it's been such a, it really is like an exercise for my mindset to practice looking at the things that, are positive and not just negative. So instead of focusing on what I didn't do, well, what did I do that made me feel good or whatever, you know, and it can be as simple as like, I ate a delicious mango today or something, you know, like, and it's just like focusing on those little things and same goes for your body, you know, like maybe you hate the way your thighs look, but your legs, like you ran, you had an amazing run or you did something that made you feel strong or, those legs carried you where, you know, like just thinking about like what your body is doing for you, because I, we so often, or at least I do take my, I take my body for granted. I take my health for granted. I know not everyone does. Mm. Um, I certainly do all the time and just stopping to think about all the incredible things your body does. Cause the body truly is incredible mm. and just kind of appreciating that and just taking a moment to, um, 
just, you know, look at the things that you can appreciate about yourself. Or again, if you can't appreciate them, just at least being somewhat neutral <laughs> towards them, mm -hmm. you know, because no one's asking you to love your body. No one's asking you to just like, oh, everything is just so wonderful. Like, but at least not like spew hatred towards it. Like, mm -hmm. let's, let's just get to the point where we can at least like respect our body and support it and give it what it needs to do the things you're asking it to do. Even if you're not training, you know, we're still asking a lot of our body just going through daily life and all the stresses and physical demands and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think just kind of ending it on that note is, and, and again, I can do more of this a hundred percent. So, uh, I always love podcast episodes like this because it's always a nice <laughs> reminder of things that I would like to do more of in my own life. Um, so just being like, okay, well, you know, thank you body for doing whatever it is, you know? So that's what I'd like to say. And like doing that a lot and consistently, like, like you said, yes. you do it every day and like, it feels like a lot at first, but it's like, if you just did it once a quarter, it probably wouldn't stick super well. So if totally. we're constantly spewing hatred <laughs> to ourselves all day long, it's like, <laughs> oh God, that's exhausting. And like, why would you mm -hmm. be good at talking positively to yourself if you never practice it consistently as if it were a skill you were trying to get better at. So I love that you brought that up. And yeah, it's super like, we're not immune to this either. Like it, it happens to everyone. So I think, yeah, just getting more tools kind of, I always equate it to driving a car. You know, it's like something that at first, when you start working at it, it's going to feel really weird and you're going to have to get used to it and learn how to do it and think about it really hard every time you go to do it. But eventually you just drive the car and you don't really think about it. You still have to drive the car. Like the car is not driving itself unless you have a Tesla, but like the car is not yeah. driving itself. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, for some people. <laughs> yeah. But like, it does get easier and something you don't have to think quite as hard about unless you're in specific circumstances that are maybe more triggering. Like you're on a really busy road and you have to really think about what you're doing. You're at a very triggering event with a bunch of family members who are making body comments and you really have to think about what you're doing. But you know, hopefully a lot of the times it's more smooth sailing once you get good at acquiring these skills. So yeah, thanks and for I, and I, bringing that up. Yeah. And I'd say the same goes for food, you know, yeah. like when we start working with clients with food, they have to think really hard about putting together a balanced meal or a snack or what they're, how they're navigating. What does their body feel like? How full or hungry, you know, like all these things that maybe they weren't accustomed to thinking about. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, it becomes a little bit more sick and sick in nature. It's a little less effort. Mm -hmm. It's so yeah, same goes with the body stuff. So I mean, I, I'd say just maybe a challenge to anyone listening for you today, if, if you want to do this, is maybe just thinking about one, if you're struggling with body image, what is one thing you can do for yourself to feel a little better today? And maybe it's something really small, like putting on some jewelry, or maybe it's a scent that a scent that you like or a certain lotion, or, you know, maybe it is an item of clothing that feels more comfortable than something else. Maybe it's certain shoes, like whatever, whatever it is. Is there one thing you can do for yourself? Maybe it's a food that just, you know, makes you feel good and you eat it and it's refreshing. Is there one thing you can do for yourself today to make yourself feel good? Mm -hmm. That's what I throw out there. Do you have any, anything that, any, or maybe you can just try, uh, jump on that one, but do you have anything else you want to throw out? Go for it. No, I love that. I think like certain clothes you wear when you want to feel confident or a certain routine you do after like a shower or, um, yeah, a certain meal that you're like, this sits really well. We talk about this all the time with like carb loading, like this sits well, so I'm going to do it. I think, um, having those tools in your toolbox and reaching for them when you're like, today's not a great day and I need to use a little bit more of these tools. Um, I think that is super helpful and it's just like, okay, yeah, it's self-care. It's like, I feel better now. Like I know for me, um, I, I, my birthday's in July. I love the summer. I get really sad in the winter. <laughs> like it's tougher for me. I have to like really like kind of work on my mindset to have a good time when it's cold out. Um, and it can yeah. absolutely negatively impact my body image too. So something I will do sometimes is I will use a self tanner and I'm like, I feel like I freaking went to the beach. This is great. Um, and it's a self care item and it's just like, Oh, like that makes me feel better. Or, um, yeah, like a certain like pair of leggings that's more comfortable. It's like, Oh, that makes me feel better. Like I can go about my day and not think about how I look. Um, so yeah, I think like if you're having a bad moment or a bad season, like gaining more things on that list of tools and reaching for them when you need them 
is important. And then obviously enlisting professional help too is also very yes. effective if you are ready. Yes. Yes. I, I, I will second the like, I mean, I think most people have like at least one item of clothing that you slip into and you're just like, ah, mm -hmm. you know, like, like putting that on. And the other thing I like to do is just like having a really good body moisturizer. So mm -hmm. my skin's like super soft, mm -hmm. you know, so like and that just is really nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, again, everyone has like little things, you know, maybe it's even just like sipping on a cup of tea or just, or maybe you really enjoy your coffee. You know, there's always at least, there's at least something. And that's like going back to that gratitude journal. I, I have looked back on the couple months and no, I, no matter how shitty my day was, like I had, I've had days where just, they are so bad. Mm -hmm. And I somehow was still able to put like, eight things on that list mm -hmm. of things that brought me joy of things I'm grateful for. And not like stupid stuff I'm grateful for. Like I'm not like saying, oh, I'm grateful for my family. I mean, not that's not stupid, yeah, but you yeah. know what I mean? Like really specific, specific things yeah. in that day I was grateful for. No matter what you can find something, I promise you, no matter who you are and what's going on in your life, I bet you can find something. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our challenge to you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wrap that up. Yeah. Awesome. This was so great. I love this conversation. Um, I think it's so important. I really appreciate you, uh, speaking with me about this. Um, I'm gonna ask you a few quick, about my quick bites questions and then we'll send you on your way. Cause I know we're up on time. Do you have to jump onto a client call right now? Or are you okay? No, I'm you're, good. Okay. You're good. Cool. I, I forgot to ask you before. Um, all right. What is your favorite post race meal or snack? Um, I really like, um, this is so freaking boring. I'm such a dietitian. I really like oatmeal with like <laughs> fruit and peanut butter. Like that's like my comfort meal and with chocolate chips for sure. And like a nice coffee makes me really happy. Um, I also, if it's like, if I'm hot and sweaty and it's like summer, I'm always like thinking about a margarita too, which isn't a meal, but that flavor is like, makes me happy. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> So are you going for like sports, sports nutrition products that are margarita flavored then? Um, I know Scratch came out with one and I know yeah. did Cliff used to have like blocks or something. Yeah. Okay. The blocks I don't like, cause they like kind of taste like yeah, tequila and I'm like, I don't want that when I'm running. Yeah. Um, but the Scratch product is great. Yeah. I just tried that and it's, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. It's lime flavored salt. I actually put it on the rim of a margarita. I don't know if they wanted me Amazing. to use it that way, but that's how I used it when I, I love first it. tried it. <laughs> That's awesome. Love it. Love it. Um, what has been your worst race nutrition experience? If you've had one? Oh, which one? Um, yeah, which one? The one that sticks out to me the most, <laughs> the most is, um, it was like my probably like second year of like running where I like, I started running and then I was like, I'm going to do a half marathon. And then I was like, that was so much fun. I need to do it again. So I did it again a month later. And then I was like, that was so much fun. I need to do it again. And then I did it again a month later. And then I did a marathon. And then next fall, I did a half marathon. So I'm like, second year of running, but like kind of deep into distance races. Haven't figured out the fueling yet, though, because I'm still like a dietetic student who doesn't know anything about sports nutrition, because they don't teach us that in school. Nope. <laughs> um, that's what the extra education's for. But um, so. I don't know what I did wrong. I, I still like looking back on it. I think, I think this is where I put it in my head that just like, if I have regular pasta, like the classic carb load meal before a race, it just doesn't go well for me. Like I can have pasta and go for a run the next day and be okay. But I don't know, like this, this is the first time it happened and it has happened again since. So like pasta for me, just like not my pre-race meal. Um, I can eat it, mm -hmm. but anyway, so I don't know what happened, but a lot of things could have happened. I had maybe the wrong foods before. I think I took like maybe a gel, like no water, like all of those like rookie mistakes oh, Okay, yeah. for a half marathon. And it was so bad. It was one of those things where I like got to the halfway point and I passed some porta potties. It was a pretty like small, like local race. So there wasn't like a ton of aid stations or anything like that. And I was like, I don't need those. <laughs> and like, I should have stopped. Um, and then it was like mile 10 and I was like walking like with my legs crossed, like dying inside oh. and like trying to hold my insides in. And, um, and I, I came across a lone porta potty, a, a, like when I really needed it and I got in there and I relieved myself and it was a disaster and there was no toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So RIP to that shirt. Um, but yeah, I finished and I was like on classic, like on the couch for like two days, like just 
miserable. <laughs> so I don't, I still don't really know what happened. It was probably a combo of things, but when people tell me they have GI issues on the run, I understand. <laughs> so do I. Yeah. I think we, I think most of us have been there at some yeah. point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what is the most exotic or interesting food that you've ever tried? Um, I think once in food science class, she, the teacher who is so cool, I still want to be her when I grow up. Um, she was just a cool lady, but she got us like cricket protein to try because that was like becoming more of a popular thing. And it was, mm-hmm. it tasted like a plant protein powder. Like it was just very gritty. Um, but yeah, I'm not that, I'm not that adventurous when it comes to food. I, yeah, more adventurous than I used to be, but like I'll I'll try like different just like types of cuisine. But if someone's like, I have mm-hmm. this like fire ant from this place that I flavored in this way, I'm like, I'm good. I'm all set. Um no <laughs> yeah. Hard pass. But cricket protein. Yeah. Was Got probably it. that. <laughs> How do you like your eggs cooked if you eat eggs? Uh scrambled or fried. Yeah. What is your favorite beverage? My favorite beverage. Um Probably iced coffee for sure. <laughs> or margaritas. Or margaritas. Sounds like. Yep, yep. Love that too. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Um, mint chocolate chip. What are your comfort foods aside from oatmeal? Uh, or is it just oatmeal? Oatmeal bowl with peanut butter, anything with peanut butter. Um, uh, chocolate chip cookies, make a mean chocolate chip cookie. Um, iced coffee is also like not a food, but it's like comfort. Um, <laughs> it's comfort that makes me more anxious because of the caffeine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I also really love, there's this, t- uh, tikka masala dish, um, from this restaurant by us in Portsmouth. If you're ever up in New Hampshire, go to Portsmouth, go to the green elephant and get their tofu tikka masala. It would be like my last meal on earth. Um, I really like that one too. Yum. And last question, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. Um, these UFOs recovery shoes that I wear with socks all day long. I keep hearing about those. Because <laughs> I work from I home. I haven't tried them. I have no fashion. Yes. We were talking about fashion sense before. I'm wearing them with socks. So that's my fashion sense. Um, yeah, like a good, <laughs> a good supportive shoe, like sneaker or something to walk around in. Like I'm just, yeah. I love, I love like, you know, the idea of wearing like cool shoes, but I always hate the aftermath. So I don't anymore. Um, so that, um, probably my koala clip for running, which is how I keep like my phone on me. Um, because I always run with my phone, um, and body glide. <laughs> body glide. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Holly. This was so much fun. What, where can everyone find you? And I know uh, give a shout out to your podcast and all the good, all of that stuff you want to share with my listeners. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. People can find me, um, on, I'm really active on Instagram, mostly a little bit on TikTok. Um, and I have the podcast too, and everything is Holly Fueled nutrition. So Holly Fueled nutrition podcast, Holly Fueled nutrition.com, Holly Fueled nutrition on social media. Um, and Holly is H O L L E Y the E always trips people up. So that's how you can find me. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks again, Holly. This was a really awesome discussion. Hopefully everyone finds it useful and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. That's our show for today. Holly, thank you so much for such a great discussion all about body image. And I hope you all enjoyed that one. I know we gave you lots of great takeaways and tips and things to practice if you are struggling with body image. If you did enjoy this episode or any of my episodes, I have a huge favor to ask. I would love it if you could please hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. If you have a minute, if you could give me a five-star rating or review, that would be so, so appreciated. And even more so if you could write a short review about something you enjoyed from this episode or really any of my episodes so that other people may find and listen to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lastly, I do have a Patreon page. You can buy me a fancy latte, as I like to say, $6 a month um, or whatever you want to give. You can give me 50 cents, a dollar, whatever. You can also join for free, technically. Um, But I'd love to see you over on my Patreon page. You get some great perks and free merchandise. And I'm just trying to grow that audience so that um, I can start putting some other content over there. So I would love to see you over there. You can get the link in um, the show notes or on my website or uh, my Instagram link page. Uh, it should be all those places. And lastly, if you just want to get in touch, email me, claire at eatforendurance.com. I'd love to hear any topic requests or feedback or anything else you'd like to share with me. All right, guys, I hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time.